Hello, Baldwin friends. My name is Dr. Craig Canaperi. I live in Guilford just like you, and I'm so excited that you guys are have been learning all about sleep and sleep problems because it's so important for you to try to get a good night of sleep every night. Unfortunately, I couldn't come talk to you this year, but I'm happy to answer some of the great questions that your teachers have sent to me. So I'm just gonna pull them up here and go through them one by one, okay? So the first is, these are kind of together, what inspired you to be a pediatric pulmonologist and did you always wanna be a pediatric pulmonologist? So to tell you guys a little bit about myself, I actually grew up in Connecticut, just like you. I'm from Glastonbury, which is another town that begins with G. And I always knew I wanted to become a doctor, but I, and I thought when I was going to medical school that I was going to be some type of pediatrician. But I didn't decide on pulmonology until I was really lucky to have a mentor, it's kind of like a teacher, who got me interested in the field. And then when I was doing my training for pulmonology, I was doing research into a problem called sleep apnea, and then I decided to also become a sleep doctor. So pulmonology is the branch of medicine that has to do with breathing problems, and sleep medicine has to do with sleep problems, and I do both of those things. What type of sleep disorders do my patients have? Well, I see a lot of different sleep problems, but here are the most common. The first is a problem called um, obstructive sleep apnea. And this is a problem that some people who snore have. And when you have sleep apnea, the breathing tube, which goes from your nose and mouth down to your lungs here, can get narrow during the night. And when it's narrow, your breathing sounds like And what happens then, if you have sleep apnea, is that your brain has to wake you up and tell you to start breathing normally again. This happens multiple times during the night. It can make it so you don't feel good the next day, even if you've had the right amount of sleep. And sometimes we treat this with surgery, sometimes we treat it with medication or other techniques. Another common problem that we see in the pediatric sleep clinic is insomnia. Insomnia is just a problem where someone's having a problem either falling asleep or staying asleep. So we work with kids starting from babies through college age to help them work on their insomnia. I'm gonna talk about two other problems that are less common, but still really interesting. The first is a problem called restless leg syndrome. This is a problem where people feel like their legs need to move or they've got a lot of energy in their legs, and this can make it difficult for them to fall asleep at night. And we will treat this either with iron therapy or medication. And finally, I wanted to say I also see people who have trouble staying awake during the day. And one of the diseases that causes this is called narcolepsy. Narcolepsy is a really interesting problem because people with narcolepsy have problems with falling asleep during the day, but they can also get other interesting things that happen. One is called sleep paralysis, where they wake up at night, but they're totally frozen and they can't move at all. Another is called cataplexy, where if someone tells them a funny joke, then their muscles get weak and they may fall over. So that's rare, but it's kind of an interesting problem. What is the worst thing that could happen from sleep deprivation? More commonly, people that are chronically sleep deprived, and this is, we'll talk about this in a little bit with teenagers, people who are just not getting enough sleep every night, this can affect them in a couple of different ways. The first is it can make it harder for them to pay attention in school. Actually, some of the learning that you do in school, you don't, create memories of it that you can access later till you get a good night of sleep the next day. Also, if you're falling asleep, it's hard to pay attention. We also know that people who are sleepy and are not getting enough sleep can have problems with depression, which is feeling sad much or all of the time, or anxiety. And finally, we know that people can get physical problems from not getting enough sleep, which you know can be problems like increasing weight, high blood pressure, et cetera. Sorry, I just wanna go back here. What are the most interesting things you've learned in your journey as a pediatrician? It's a really good question. I, I think I've honestly been really lucky to learn a lot of cool things. First of all, I learned that medicine is a team sport, meaning that when I work in the hospital, I work with nurses, 
physical therapists, respiratory therapists, pharmacists, etc. We all work together to make sure the children that we're taking care of are getting the best possible care. Another interesting thing I've learned is I, I've seen children from all over the world. Some, many of the children I see have been born in Connecticut, but some have been born elsewhere in Latin America, in Asia, etc. And I'm learning that, you know, kids are more alike than different. They may have, they may speak different languages, their families may eat different types of food, but they all like spending time with their family and friends. They all, they all enjoy, uh, honestly, a lot of them enjoy playing video games. They enjoy sports. And it's actually really fun to talk to kids about the things that they're interested in. And I learn interesting things every day from my patients when they come in and tell me about the problems they're having or the things that they've solved or even the interesting things that they're dealing with that have nothing to do with, uh, with the reason they're coming to see me. For example, I saw a young man in clinic today who has his hobby is repairing electronics and he's working on repairing a 20 year old Xbox. Oh, it was pretty cool. How many patients do I see on a daily basis? So on the days that I see patients, it's pretty typical for me to see about 20 patients. Uh, we could pro I could probably see more, but I wanna make sure I have enough time to talk to every child and parent who comes in to see me and come up with a good plan so they walk out of the clinic feeling confident that we're gonna fix their problems. How often do I have patients that are struggling with sleep? Pretty often, actually. Of the patients that I see, I'd say about a half of them come for breathing problems and half of them come for sleep problems. Some of them have both. Why does having not enough sleep affect teens so much? I would argue that not having enough sleep affects everyone. We just know that it's more likely for teenagers to have difficulty with sleep. And the reason, the reason for this is as people become teenagers, and you guys right now in sixth grade, I believe many of you are 10, 11, 12. Right now, as you're becoming older and moving to being a teenager, your body clock is gonna move later, meaning that you may have easily fallen asleep at seven or eight, but by the time you're 15 or 16, it'll be more common for your body to fall asleep at nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, or even later. We also know in Guilford, like in many other towns, school starts earlier. So when people's bodies tell them to go to sleep later, but they have to get up earlier, it makes it harder for them to get enough sleep. And teenagers, just like younger children, or just like younger children or adults, have many of the same problems with sleep. Another thing that's important to know with teenagers is some teenagers actually are able to drive cars. And we know that it's not safe to drive if you're sleepy. So that's a really important safety thing for us to think about with teenagers to make sure they get enough sleep before they drive, just like for your mom or dad. Why does not enough, sorry, why is REM sleep important? So this is a great question. There's different types of sleep. There's non-REM sleep, which includes stage one, really light sleep. Stage two, which is about half of the night. And stage three, which is deep sleep or slow wave sleep. REM sleep is dream sleep. And if we look at the brainwave measurements we take in the sleep laboratory, that REM sleep looks like the most like being awake. And what's interesting about REM sleep is if you wake up from a dream, if you wake up from REM sleep, you're wide awake. You can actually tell someone what you were dreaming. Whereas you wake up from other types of sleep, you're really sleepy and you may not even remember it the next day and you're not gonna be able to tell someone a story about what you were thinking about. Another thing that's interesting about REM sleep is your body is totally paralyzed during REM sleep except for two sets of muscles. The first is the muscles around your eyes and the second is your diaphragm. So REM stands for rapid eye movement sleep. One of the ways we know people are having it is because their eyes are moving during it. Another is because we can see that their muscle tone and all their other muscles is going down. The reason it's important is some types of learning, the technical term is encoding, happen only during REM sleep. And REM sleep tends to happen more in the second half of the night, like in the early morning. So if someone has to get up too early or is not getting enough sleep, they may miss one or two REM periods. It makes it harder for them to learn. How much sleep is recommended for teens? So let's back up a little bit. Let's say for preteens, like people your age, the, the sleep recommendations are usually nine to 11 hours of sleep. For teenagers, it's more in the eight to 10 hour range and everybody's a little bit different in terms of what they need. What advice do I have on getting a good night of sleep? Uh, 
A couple of things. First of all, I don't want you to worry sometimes if you're having a, if you're struggling to sleep on one or two nights in a month. This is normal. And sometimes people get really worried if they're having a bad night of sleep. Everybody's entitled to struggle with sleep once in a while. But in general, what you need to do is try to go to the bed at the same time, more or less, every night. And get up kind of at the same time, because if you're moving your schedule around every night, it's hard for your body to know when you to sleep. When It's hard for your body to know when it should fall asleep and when it should wake up. Another thing that's important is to try to avoid screens before bedtime. We all like screens, right? Like televisions, smartphones, tablets, etc. And these are fun devices that have their place, but we know right before bedtime they can affect sleep. And there's three reasons for that. The first is that light exposure can reduce your natural sleep drive. The second is what we call a time displacement. If you've ever picked up your tablet to look at it for a minute to check something, and then all of a sudden it's 30 minutes later and you don't even know what has happened, that's time displacement. And the third is activation, right? If you're playing Brawl Stars on your tablet, you're probably getting really excited. That's not good for getting ready for bed. So turning your lights down, putting your device away, doing a quiet activity like reading before bed is a really good idea. And sleeping in a room that is dark and quiet. What do you think the most important study you've done in sleep? So research we do in our sleep program at Yale, kind of like the way we take care of our patients is a team sport. One of my closest collaborators is a researcher named Monica Ordway. And what Monica has been studying is the sleep patterns of children who live in New Haven, who don't necessarily, who's, of, of, she's studying the sleep patterns of children whose families may be struggling a little bit with having enough money to pay for their needs. And understanding the sleep needs of those children, which are a little bit different from the sleep needs of most of the kids in Guilford. So we've been trying to understand what those sleep needs are for their children, those children, and we've actually designed an intervention to help their parents improve their sleep because everybody deserves a good night of sleep. If you think about it, everybody in the world deserves a good night of sleep. So that's what we've been working on. What did, why did I want to change the start time in Guilford? Thanks for reminding me because I, I need to continue to work on this. About five or six years ago, myself and a number of concerned parents were working with the teachers and the Board of Ed Education to move the high school start times later because we know that when teenagers naturally want to fall asleep later and get up later, when school is very early and high school is quite early in Guilford, it can make it so those teenagers can't get enough sleep and it can affect their health. So we moved the high school start times around 15 minutes later, and I'd like, we'd like to move it further, but it's a complicated problem because moving the times for the high school affects everybody that lives in the district. Um, we'd actually, have, I have been working a little bit with people at the state capitol, see if we could do this across the state. And the state, the state of California this fall had put into effect a law saying that nobody can start high school before 8.30. And I think that's a better way to do it than to try to change it in each town like we do in Connecticut right now. And finally, what is my sleep routine? Great question. I try to put my devices away about an hour before I go to bed. So I usually go to bed around 10.30. So I try to be off the television, off my phone, etc. by 9.30. I'll get into my pajamas, Usually I'll read a book and do, you know, just try to be very relaxed when I get into bed. Uh, and I, I try not to vary the time when I go to bed too much. I actually track my sleep with this funny little ring right here, which is called an O-ring. But if you, have a, if you have a Fitbit, that can also track your sleep. And if you're interested in learning about your sleep, that's a cool kind of tool, cool gadget or toy, but you can also just write down when you fall asleep and wake up and ca capture that over a couple of days. I know there's one other question as well. Hold on for one second. So one last question I had was, can we see your dog Zelda? And the answer is yes, let me get her right now. So if you have a dog, you know, they sleep like 18 hours a day. So this girl, when she's not running around and barking at kids in our neighborhood, sorry kids, she is sleeping. So anyway, I really appreciate your questions. And if your teacher, if you have any more questions, let your teachers know. And they know how to get a hold of me. And I wish you sweet dreams. Thank you very much.